Okay, we're gonna get started. Thanks for being here today. Happy Wednesday. Today, we're gonna to be talking about efficient grading practices in ELA. So if you would like to join our monthly challenge, we have the link here. We also have it at the end of the slideshow, which you can grab the slide deck on the page here. So, oh, let me click on the right thing. All right, there we go. I guess I can't use my keyboard. Okay, today we wanna to be committed, responsible, respectful, and safe. And for professional development norms for online or virtual learning, please make your, mute your microphone, turn on your camera so I can see your face if you feel comfortable. And if you have a question, please drop it in the chat. Today, we are going to be working mostly on, um, oh, mostly on feedback as our instructional priority because grading essentially should be feedback to students. So our learning intention today is that we're learning strategies for grading efficiently in ELA. And our success criteria is that we go home at contract time with all of our grading complete. So this might not happen today or tomorrow, but this is a goal and a practice that I want all teachers in Kenyon School District, but especially English teachers to be able to do. The rationale is that we need a work-life balance. So don't get so busy making a living that you forget to make a life from the one and only queen, Dolly Parton. <laughs> so here's our agenda. And I'm gonna be sharing strategies that I used in my class and strategies that I've read about. So we're gonna talk about must do's and can do's. What I learned from teaching AP Lang and never having to grade at home. Rubrics, the good and the time consuming. How a timer can be your best friend. You're not paid to be an editor. In-class feedback and revisions and getting those highlighters out. So must do's and can do's. So first of all, a must do or an assignment that is a must do or an assessment that is a must do is something that is essential to student learning. It's tied to a standard and it's a knowledge or skill needed for the assessment or for the culminating activity. And in ELA, most of our assessments and our culminating activities are discussions, Socratic seminars, and essay writing. Can-dos are things that maybe aren't necessary. You can make it fit a standard and it's not really needed for the assessment or the culminating activity. Often these are the things that students might really remember their activities. I remember when I was teaching Animal Farm, we made up our own 10 commandments and kids loved it and they remembered it, but it really wasn't tied to a standard. And it was just something fun to help them build connection with the book. So we don't, oh, I hate that it's doing that. I'm gonna go back. So we don't need to grade can-dos, but we should and we must grade must-dos. So when my students made their 10 commandments and it was fun and they presented it to class and everybody laughed, that was great. It was a way to build community. It was a way to build background knowledge in the book, but I didn't grade it. It wasn't necessary. Let me give you another example. So I taught 10th grade English for many, many years and I was teaching this standard, RL4, which is determine meanings of words and phrases, figurative and connotative meanings, analyze the impact of word choices on meaning and tone. So we were in the middle of night and we read a letter from an SS officer to a man named Willie Just, and he is a mechanic of some sort. So as we, so we did this activity, I called it the, the Willie Just letter. So this was the assignment that students filled out. I know it looks really bare bones, but you know, most of teaching happens off the paper. So we would actually look up the definitions for all of these words, and then we would read the letter. And I would then go to question number one and help 
kids figure out what this letter was actually about. The letter was about uh, making modifications to the gas thing. Ads. Hi. So they would read this letter and not really know what was going on because the, the language in the letter was very euphemistic. So then we would do the connotation with the Nazi definition. And then we would look at what the tone was and a lot of students struggle with the tone. And then we would, once I kind of gave them this tone because they really struggled with it, they would go back and determine what words contribute to that tone. So it's kind of really important that this was, uh, this first section was assessing the meaning of words and phrases. And this question number three was assessing the second part of the standard, but I didn't grade the entire thing. I only graded this last question because that was the must do. That was the meat of the standard. That is what I wanted to get to. And so I assessed number three. I didn't assess the rest of this. So that's an example of only grading a must do versus a can do. Okay, I wanna talk about what I learned from teaching AP Lang that helped me with grading. First things first, you always use model essays in ELA. So they, uh, kids read model uh, AP essays from years and years and years in the past. The second thing that I really learned and perfected with students was students scoring themselves and their peers. And one thing I did to kind of facilitate that process is we would always look at a model then we would look at the prompt and then they would write their own. And I started writing with students and then we would randomly pick a couple to do a whole class scoring and one of them was always mine. Now I'm a little lucky. The 1999 prompt for AP Lit, one of the model essays that AP published for years was mine. And so I started the year out by having students critique this essay and they didn't know it was mine. And then I told them later it was mine. And we, we got to talk about how you improve as a writer and it's okay to not have it perfect the first time. So really teaching students how to score themselves and their peers is a great way to help students revise and reflect and assess their own writing. They will improve as they go. The third thing I learned from teaching AP Lang was that a writing conference was way more powerful than any written notes I could write on a paper. Written notes can't really convey anything and written notes don't actually allow students to ask questions or to clarify. So I stopped. I would just put their score on their paper and then they met with me in writing conferences. And I really think that was the number one thing that improved writing for my students. Is it time consuming? Yes. Was it worth every moment? Yes. And the last is holistic grading. I know that we use rubrics for everything, but the AP rubric, the way it used to be, they've changed, was a holistic rubric. And what that means is that you give the paper one score and there's a rubric for what that one score means. What that did for me was to really look at the key components of the paper, the ideas, the thesis, the evidence, the explanation, and bypass kind of all of those things that might not be as important. So when we're talking about grading and holistic grading, decide what's most important for your essay, for what you're teaching in the moment, and grade that, just grade that part. That's the must do, right? Okay, next. Oh, I wanted to give you an example. So write the world, you can click on this. It will take you to the website. It is a real world writing website for students and it has student essays. So it has writing prompts, competitions. Students can peer review. They can submit their writing for expert reviews. They can do writing groups. It's a really great thing. And I think it brings a real world aspect to writing um, with real feedback and publishing opportunities. So it's a great website, go check it out. Okay, the next thing that I did 
that helped me speed up my writing or my grading was my rubrics. So I'm going to show you two different examples of what an A or a four or a five or a six or whatever the top score would be on a rubric. And I pulled these from the internet, so they are not anybody personally. So this one says makes a strong stand and defines the context in the introductory paragraph. Position is restated throughout and reinforced with examples and it's included in the conclusion. This other example is that is from the Florida State. And I love this. It's, this response is fully sustained and consistently focused with purpose audience task, clear controlling idea, effective organizational structure, creating coherence and completeness. I mean, has a student read this far? Probably not. Does a student know what's on this rubric? No. Strongly maintained controlling idea with little or no loosely related material. Do you see how many subjective words are in here? Strongly, little or no. Um, skillful use of transitions. Well, that's that's a that's really subjective. Logical progression. I can get it behind that. Um, appropriate style. What's appropriate? I guess for the purpose, but it's not clear to a student reading this what their purpose or what their style should be. So I, I bring this up because you have to know your focus for your rubric and what are you really assessing? I, have str I struggle with rubrics like this because they're so complex and so detailed that students don't know. I mean, here's a four, it's four points and then there's a three and it's often you're really debating. And if it takes you a long time to process what your own rubric is saying and decide between a three and a four, we need to change that rubric. We need to make it more accessible for you and for students. Oh. Next, in-class feedback and revisions. So this is a strategy that I used um, and I always had students draft their essays in class. I wanted to be there for that essay writing part because of what I would do. So I call this a gradual release drafting method. Here's what you do. When you're ready to start drafting, you pull every kid to the back of your room or to the side of your room or into the hallway and they need to bring all their stuff with them because you're going to have them self-assess. And so they're gonna self-assess whether or not they're ready to start drafting, give them a checklist, and then they rate themselves as a one, two, three. Ones, I'm ready to go. Two, I have some questions. Three, I'm a little lost and I need help. So student, my checklist was usually, do you have your thesis approved? Is your outline ready? If we've done research, do you have your research ready or your sources? Do you have, if we aren't doing research, but we're using a novel, do you have your novel with you? <laughs> Those sorts of things. If students self-assess that they were ready to go and they were a three, I would send them to the front of my classroom and tell them to sit in the first two rows. If I had a lot of students who are ready, then the first three rows, you know, however many students you have, I had eight rows. So then every student that was a two, I'd say, okay, if you're a two, what question do you have? And they would start raising their hands and answering questions. And I would answer their questions. And as they felt ready to go, then they would release themselves from my back group and go sit in a desk as close to the front as they could and start writing. And then with the ones or the twos who maybe thought they were twos, but were probably ones, I would actually sit down with them, have them turn my back desks around to face me and we would do a reteaching session. And usually these students were ones who missed a lot of class, who maybe needed time to draft or to do their outline. Sometimes they were students who needed to completely change their topic. So it really depended. And I was able to work with them in small groups until they were ready to draft. And then they would just turn their desk around. And that was the indicator to me that they were ready to draft and they were drafting. Now, once I got everybody kind of going, I would then circle, circle, circle. And I would walk up and down every row. And I would read a student's essay and give feedback 
go to the next kid, read, give feedback, read, give feedback. And usually we would spend two, two days drafting and I could usually read every student's essay three or four times, walking and giving feedback, walking and giving feedback, walking and answering questions. And so what ended up happening is that by the time I graded their final draft, I've read their essay many times and it has been refined as they've gone. And so grading a great essay is a whole lot easier and a whole lot faster than grading a poor essay. The last thing is to get those highlighters out. Now, last month, Scott interviewed Stephanie and Erica and talked about chunking an essay. Part of that chunking, and they mentioned it in their question and answer, so you can go back and listen to them, but they talked about using having students highlight the sections of their essay, like their highlight their final draft before grading. So this is actually one of my AP students' essays. And you can see, I have them highlight their intro and thesis, their first main point, their evidence and explanation, right? And so you can see that yellow at the very bottom was their second main point. What this does is it helps students know if they're missing sections of their paper, and it really helps you zero in on what you're emphasizing in grading. If my emphasis for this essay is evidence and explanation, then I'm only going to look at those sections. I'm still gonna have kids highlight all of it, right? For what you kind of focus on, but those are the things that I'm gonna zoom in on. And it really helps you quickly go back in the essay and find things if you need to find them. And a timer can be your best friend. So I had a rule. I set my timer for five minutes. If an essay took longer than five minutes, and I'm talking an essay, not like an extended research paper, but an essay, I stopped grading because a five paragraph essay should not take more than five minutes to grade. Students who really struggle with their ideas, it's very confusing, the writing is really poor and you, and you can't piece it together, that's what takes us a long time. And right away, my feedback to that student would be, we need to have a writing conference and we need to revise because I have so much feedback for that student, I'm not gonna put it in writing. And we're gonna talk about why in a second, but you can tell a lot from the first five minutes of grading. If you see so many grammatical errors that it's causing disruption in the flow of the reading of the essay, you can tell that within the first page. Students don't make mistakes just randomly, like it, they are habitual mistakes. And so that's something that you can see right away. So set your timer for five minutes, stop and move on, right? You know that this student's gonna need some one-on-one -on -one help if it takes you longer than that to grade their paper. And you're not paid to be an editor, you're a teacher. Remember that. I want you to look at this paper. If you got this paper back from a teacher, what would you think? I want you to picture being 14 years old and getting this. Does it make you feel good about writing? Does it make you feel good about yourself as a writer? And what are you gonna do with it? Now I look at this paper and I see a whole lot of editing marks. Don't be an editor, okay? And I also see maybe some good ideas or some phrases and rewording in here. So you have to think about the time versus value. Going through and editing, editing that student's paper, number one, it's not gonna make them a better writer in the future. And number two, that time you're taking isn't going to pay out with student writing improvement. They're gonna go through and on their second draft, they're gonna fix all those mistakes that you pointed out but that's all they're going to do. The second thing you wanna think about is writing scars. As a teacher in high school, by the time they get to us in high school, a lot of kids have writing scars. Petrified. I had kids who couldn't get ideas on paper. They were so terrified by writing and they were so put down on by writing. So this kind of feedback where it's so much it's too overwhelming. 
So if you see a lot of grammatical errors, make a note of common mistakes that you can use to reteach or do mini lessons. And in the rubric, just make a general comment, like review your comma rules. And I don't mark comma mistakes. Now, if a student says, I don't understand in my writing conference with them, then I can say, great, let's do a mini lesson right now on your commas. And I will take two or three sentences and there's probably gonna be a mistake in them. And then we can edit that one or two sentences together and then stop there. Because an essay, the real meat of an essay, the good stuff, the ideas, do commas matter? Sometimes, but not always. So really think about what's most important and what you are grading the most, right? What's that must do in your grading? So those are my tips. I just wanna tell you that my last two years of teaching, I taught uh, seven periods out of eight. I had AP, English 10, and I taught mythology. And in Jordan District, it counts as senior English. And so I was expected to teach all three writing essays. So we did three writing essays in a semester and I never took grading home. I was planned. I used my prep time wisely. I would grade before school, I'd grade after, after school, but really determining what was most important really helped cut down my grading. So if you wanna do our monthly challenge, this is going to be March slash April's topic and reach out to me or Scott and we can brainstorm strategies to help you help ease your grading load because you need to go home, be with your family, your pets, your kids, your friends by yourself, whatever. We need work-life balance. Thanks everybody.